Everybody is passionate about storytelling, and that's why we're here. And if we're here, it's because we want you to be better storyteller. And so that's why we created these masterclass series, especially during COVID, because we want to hear from people that are navigating the industry the challenges but also the opportunities that you can find out there. And this passion is really what I hope is going to inspire. But starting from there, you know, um, because we talked about cinema and, and plotting and structure, now we, I want to dive into your story, Billy, and really start to learn, you know, you mentioned before when we first met, you know, you watched uh, someone flew on the cuckoo's nest and you understood how the power of films and, and that's what you wanted to do. So. Can you explain us, you know, when was the first moment exactly you said, okay, this is what I want to do, and then how you navigated through, eventually, you know, also breaking through the industry. What was your access? What was the challenges that you faced, and how did you eventually start? Sure. Um, do I need to turn this up? Okay. There we go. Um, you can crunch. It's okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We'll talk louder, okay? This man, who I think is going to be my friend for the rest of my life, chose the loudest snack in San Francisco. And now he doesn't know if he can actually eat it while we're doing this. Like, she's got her bear claw. She's going to be fine. He's got these super crisp potato chips, and he's in the front row. Do it. Okay? It's okay. It's the I'm beginning not, of the movie, by the way. It's I'm totally in. fine. All right. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, the AMC ad that Nicole Kidman does, you know, um, somehow heartbreak feels good in a place like this. Um, anyway, I wrote that ad. And it's about a celebration of people loving movies. So as far as I'm concerned, this is popcorn. And you're here because you love movies? Go for it. I'm fine with it. All right, so I grew up in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents uh, split when I was four. My father lived in the city. We lived in the valley. If you know L.A. at all, we lived in the San Fernando Valley uh, in an apartment building on Balboa Boulevard. Um, I shared a bedroom with my sister until I was 12. Uh, my father was a literary agent. He represented screenwriters, so I was around the business. I spent weekends with him, so I, I had a, a familiarity of what it was, and I had a reverence for great writing. Um, my father was absolutely determined to keep me out of show business because he thought it was a cesspool. He hated it. He made a great living at it, but he hated it. And um, I wanted to write. I thought I wanted to be a journalist at first, but I was always writing short stories. I, I had a lot to say. As you can see, I still do. And when I was um, 19, uh, I walked into my father's office and I said, I want to be a screenwriter. And he said, come here. Back in those days, um, agencies had printed copies of all their clients' scripts. They literally had a back room with shelves, racks of just screenplays. It went on forever. So he pulls out a copy of the screenplay for Ordinary People, written by his client Alvin Sargent, which had won Best Picture and Best Screenplay. And he handed it to me. He said, okay, do this, which is where he was setting the bar. I've been trying to hit that bar ever since. I have, I don't know how many movies I've had made. I, I literally, I don't count them. But there's only one movie poster on my wall, and it's Ordinary People, which I did not write, mm -hmm. to remind me that's true north, that level of excellence, that level of execution, that's where I'm trying to go. And I will be trying to hit it until the day I collapse, which could be tomorrow, you never know. But I'm gonna, until that day comes, every second that I can be working and getting better and trying to get closer to that mountaintop, that's what I'm going to be doing. There are so many variables that will affect your ability to make a living in this business, and you have no control over 99% of them. 
You have no control over the state of our economy or whether there's going to be COVID or the health of our industry or whether superhero movies are in or out. You have no control over any of that, and yet it's going to profoundly impact your ability to make a living. There's one variable over which you have any control, just one, your willingness to work hard. You better maximize that variable. I'm up at eight. I'm writing until one. I take a break till 1.15, and I'm back at it until six. I'm not surfing the web. I'm not gambling online. I'm not trying to find ex-girlfriends on Facebook. I'm not doing anything but working because there are mountaintops I'm trying to get to, and I'm not there yet. I can see them from here, but I'm not close. And I know I'm not going to be a content person until I get there. Only work will get me there. So I treat every single meeting as if it's an audition. Even if it's somebody that I've worked with for 20 years, when I sit down with them, I consciously pretend I've never met this person before and it's time to make my first impression. And that first impression is, you're never going to meet anybody who's going to be more collegial, more open to notes, more professional, harder working, more energy, less ego than me. Speaking of subtext, the subtext of every meeting I walk into is, you're fucking insane if you hire somebody else. That's my subtext. You don't say it, right? But that's what I'm communicating. Couldn't we make the argument that there's been tremendous subtext in the last hour and 50 minutes in this room? Wouldn't you say that my behavior has said to you, I want to be your favorite guest lecturer you've ever had in your life? Isn't that how I've behaved? I wouldn't say it, but isn't it so clear to you that's what I want? That's subtext, right? That's that energy. That's the passion that he's talking about. There's something that I want to achieve in here today. I don't need to state it, I just need to do it. That's subtext, that's working hard. That's setting goals, and, and again, exactly, you know, we know that all of you have stories and um, you know, are capable of telling fantastic stories because we saw it into our thesis class, into our screenwriting class where you creating your own scripts. But again, you know, it's, it's it's, it's that passion that really is going to make the difference, although there's a lot of work, real work that well, has to course, be Well, of course, and, and uh, a, a goal without a plan is a wish, right? You guys in the wishing business? You guys in the succeeding business? Which is exactly knowing the rules of the game you're playing. And, you know, when it comes to that, I was watching a master class, and this section is designed for you to ask your questions. So I'll please start thinking about them in a second. I just want to ask him one more thing, and then, you know, we'll, we'll jump forth and back to have you finally talking uh, to Billy and ask all your questions about, you know, it could be Captain Phillips, it could be just something you heard this morning, it could be exactly, uh, you know, how it went with Nicole Kidman, how he's working with Nicole Kidman, you know, sure. with a great actress, I don't know. But um, my, my thing before I pass it to them is um, I, I, I watched a masterclass um, with David Lynch recently and thought it was absolutely interesting because we all know David Lynch, right? kind of different and diverse uh, filmmaker even though, even though so successful, you know, in his dreaming films. And they asked him, how do you come up with an idea for a film? And he said, for me, it's like fishing. You know, the very first thing is going out there and then you never know what you're going to get. And, and, and so for me, the question for you is, where do you, where do you look for your ideas? Is it in yourself? Is it in the news? Where, when do you, where do you look for films and stories and when do you know that you got that story that c could really be something? Sure. Um, I'm very, very fortunate. I've been working at this a long time. I mean, a long, long time. Um, you know, I'm 60. I've been at this for a while. And I'm at a place now because of the work that I've done where stories come to me. People offer me stuff. 
And so I'm constantly choosing between, I don't know, five or six at any moment, where do I want to put my sweat equity? Um, and I have a very, very simple litmus test that I apply, which is which is the one that I wake up thinking about. That's everything. If you have a story that someone's thrown at you and has stars attached and a boatload of money and a great director and you don't wake up thinking about it, I'm going to pass. If there isn't something in there that is trying to claw its way out subconsciously, you're not going to be inspired, you're not going to do your best work, you're not going to impress anybody, and you're not going to get hired for the next job. So do the one that is telling you, you must speak to me. You must write me or I'm going to keep bugging you. So that's step one, is you pick the one that you wake up thinking about. And then the first question that I ask myself, we're into, we're into process now. The first question that I ask myself is, okay, what does that movie want to feel like tonally? Is it a chase movie? Is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it a whatever? And then I will go find a movie that has that kind of tone mm -hmm and I will buy the soundtrack, and I'll just start listening to the music from that movie that's already been made, which puts me in the emotional headspace I need to be in to think about my movie. Like if you're writing a movie that has a great chase sequence in it, listen to some chase music. It'll get you in that place. If you're writing a drama, go listen to the soundtrack from The Thin Red Line, written by Hans Zimmer. I mean, it's fucking Mozart-level writing. It's incredible, <laughs> but it'll put you in that place. And I drive around or I walk around and I think about that music and I'm, I have a notepad with me at all times and I'm constantly taking notes. By the way, pull over before you make the notes, <laughs> okay? That's a little PSA for you. Um, and when I have a stack of notes like this, then I open my computer and I start to put all these notes in a treatment. I never write without a treatment. I'll get you one second. Um, I never write without a treatment first, ever. And what I'm doing is I'm just sort of writing random thoughts from these little pieces of paper and napkins and notepads by my bed. And I'm not judging it. I'm not editing it. I'm just letting it go. And then when I've written down everything that I know from all of those notes and I've let my imagination wander. Do you guys know how to do the sculpture of an elephant? You start with a block of granite and you chip away everything that's not an elephant, right? There's no other way to do it. You can't build the elephant, right? Okay, so you've got all these random thoughts, all these ideas about character, story, the world, etc. That's your block of granite. You step back and you're, okay, where's the story I'm telling you there? Where's the elephant? Oh, okay, what's interesting about that is there's no place like home. Okay, I'm going to get rid of everything that doesn't say there's no place like home. Chip, 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 chip. There's your elephant. Right? That's how you do it. It's letting your brain expand completely to let in any thought in the world that may have any tangential relationship to this idea. And then saying, what's the story I'm telling? By the way, when you shoot the movie, same thing. The first cut of the movie is another block of granite. Way too many scenes, things that you thought you needed that you don't. You step back from that first cut, which usually is garbage, and you say, where's the elephant in there? Oh, let's take out all the scenes and all the moments that don't feed that idea. It never stops. You're always trying to create the elephant. And knowing what the elephant is, is the key. Wow, wonderful. These comparison, especially with sculpture, right? It's, it's just so inspiring. So take notes. But I, I really want to... So I welcome you in this conversation. So who has questions to make this debate even more interesting? Yes. Your name? We would love to know also your name, guys. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Welcome. And a little louder so that everybody can hear. Okay, how do you, how do you collaborate with actors and crew? Okay, so here's what I think is really important, is separating the what from the how. <clears throat> and by that I mean, you've written it, yes? You're planning to direct it? Okay, so you're in charge of the what. 
What is it? Right? What's the story we're telling? I want to tell a story that says love conquers all. I'm making that up. Okay? Everybody else is there to help you execute the how. Okay, how are we going to tell that story? How are we going to tailor performances to tell that story? How are we going to build a set that tells that story? How are we going to decorate that set? Where's the camera going to go? How are we going to move it? Or are we not going to move it at all? How are we going to light it? How is sound going to be a part of that story? Right? All of these elements in which you stop telling them what to do and you start inviting them into the creative process. What do you think? What's your instinct about this? What interested you about the script? What made you want to play this part? Let's explore that. Where did I lose you? Were you ever bored? Like you're literally, every time I sit down, when I, someone's going to go let me direct a miniseries, right? I've written it. They've agreed to pay for it. Like in every way they are validating me and what I've written, right? They're going to let me direct it. And they're going to give me $34 million to go make four hours of filmed entertainment. Every meeting I have, as I'm interviewing DPs, editors, production designers, whoever, first thing I ask when they sit down, do you have any notes for me? First thing I ask, I want their criticism of the script. First thing, was there anywhere where the story lost you? Was there anywhere you felt confused? Anywhere that it felt slow? And I have to really want their answers. And when, and when you sit down with an actor, you're saying to them, okay, what drew you to this? Was there any place where the character didn't make sense to you? How can I help you? Right? Because it is the most collaborative medium in the world, by far. It's not a novel. It's not a play. It's a bunch of us. It's why I would never take a film by credit at the point of a gun. I think it's criminal. Unless the film by credit will actually get more butts in seats. A film by Martin Scorsese, okay, fine. Fine. A film by Steven Spielberg, yes, that's part of what you're selling. And there are a couple out there where you could make that argument. But other than that, a film by, it's just not true. It's a film by 300 people. But my point is, it's alchemy. It's one plus one equals three. It's your script plus this actress becomes this other thing that's better. It's not you saying, here's how we're going to play this part. Do it my way. It's let's find the best way together. Let's take my script, your talent. It should evolve. The goal of making something, three words, beat the page. That's what you're trying to do. We already know you can write or we wouldn't be making it. How much better can it get? What's living between the words? What's living behind the words? That's what the crew's there for. That's what the actresses are there for. So that's, if you approach that, with that spirit of generosity and openness, they'll kill for you. And you'll get the best of their talent. And guess who gets the credit at the end? If you get a brilliant performance out of that actress, people will come up to you and say, oh my god, you're an actor's director. Right? Okay, you win. But I really do believe that he's building trust because behind this is all building trust. And, you know, it's not just giving a little chip or a cookie, you know. It's really, I'm here for you because you're here for me. And this is the beauty of moving, making movies, right? When your film becomes everybody else's film. And so glad that we're hearing, uh, you know, from such a talented, uh, passionate artist. Because even last time when Steve Starkey came here, um, and, and we were talking about Forrest Gump, that's what he said. He said, I'm not here you know, to hire people to tell them what to do. I'm here to hire people and get inspired for them, with them to make a better picture. So this was an amazing question that goes back to you guys in our school to keep working together and making films with the people that are sitting next to you because you never know what is going to happen tomorrow. But yeah, sometimes there was the best answer to any question is let's find out together. Yeah. There was a question, yeah. Yes, yes. I just want to say thank you for being here. Oh, my, it's a privilege. Um, thank you. No, it's, yeah, please. It's, it's okay. it's, I'm just so grateful that you're here. Thank you. Just to have you right here to ask questions. And Do you want some audience, chips? You can hack him. You can hack him after. Oh, terrific. <laughs> I, I Do you want some of his <laughs> chips, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> it look amazing. Uh, 
I um, have a very simple question. Mm -hmm. At what point, and for those that are listening on the Zoom, at what point does the character, and from the screenwriting perspective, from the creativity, at what point does the character realize they've been climbing the wrong mountain? Is mm -hmm. it through metaphor, subjects, context? How would you creatively convey it to the audience that they've been running, uh, climbing, perhaps climbing the wrong mountain? Are they climbing a mountain? Is it the wrong mountain? Okay. It's really a life metaphor. Sure. And uh, did, any, did anyone not hear the question? When, how, does, how do you reach a point where the character realizes that they are chasing the wrong thing, they're climbing the wrong mountain? Um, okay, well this could be uh, a story about a woman who's been pursuing a love interest and then finds out that love interest is the wrong idea. Um, in Rocky, it's literally the moment where he realizes, oh, I can't beat him. This thing's been driving me. I actually can't get there. And he's got to change his goal because his goal is actually much more profound than winning a fight. And sometimes that was just, it, literally in that movie, it's just one line from one guy. Literally a guy saying, doesn't really matter, does it? I'm sure he'll give us a great show. And he realizes, oh, I'm, I'm a joke. Um, in The Godfather, it certainly happens. In The Godfather, Michael Corleone is constantly wondering, what is the thing I should be pursuing? Should I be leaning into K, my family family, or should I be doing all of this, my false family, which he begins to think is his real family? So the answer is, there are a million different ways you can do it. When a screenplay is working, the character tells you. You get to a place where you write a line and you go, oh, he actually wouldn't say that. The characters become a person by that point. And, they, and you, can't, you can't put a line in there that they wouldn't say. You can't put a choice in there that they wouldn't make because they've become real. And they're starting to dictate the terms of the screenplay to you. That's literally how you know that it's gaining traction in your head. Does that answer your question? Very vaguely, but it does. Okay. <laughs> but the point is, there's no wrong way to do what you're talking about. I mean, um, there's always a, a moment in which, you know, there is... I, like he was saying, no, a realization that there is a goal so that what you're doing maybe is not exactly working and that brings you to that. Yeah, I mean, in, in, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in Sons of the Lambs, there's a moment where Clarice realizes, oh, I'm here. Oh, I've been totally misled. I need to be there. And in some cases, that's a story thing. In some cases, that's a character thing. Um, I'm trying to think of the other movies that we, that we referenced today. Um, yeah, again. Also, Al Pacino in The Godfather, he doesn't want to be part of the family, and then he finds out that actually that's the only way to become right. his real family. And in Jaws, Chief Brody is constantly recalibrating. But I, constantly. I, I want to go on something that for me is very important when, it come, when we go to screenwriting. Um, I think that writing is rewriting. And, and the process never ends until maybe you have that first, um, first day uh, of production. You know, actually, I, w I just met with uh, an actor, an Italian actor, uh, that is playing a part for uh, Johnny Depp, news film, uh, Modigliani in Italy, and he was saying Johnny Depp will come on set with new scenes every day and keep doing the process. How is that process for you, and especially to regard to feedbacks? How do you incorporate feedbacks? And, you know, I think that the most beautiful thing is to understand when to receive and welcome a feedback, but also when maybe that feedback is not really working, it's not what you want to say, and you have to s stick with your ideas. So mm -hmm. how do you work around feedbacks? What is your sure. process? Okay, so the first thing is a basic understanding for me, which is two things. One, I'm not a genius. I'm completely comfortable with the idea that I am not a genius. And I'm going to need help. I'm going to need input. I'm going to need notes. I'm going to need direction. Um, it, I, I, I constantly refer to drafts in terms of radar. Like, I'm sending it out there so that something will ping back. I need to echolocate so that I can know, am I hitting my target or not? 
Um, mm -hmm. I can only get that by giving it to other people and seeing how they're responding. Second thing is, it's the most collaborative medium in the world, right? It's not a novel, it's not a play. It may be your script, but it's their money. That makes them filmmakers too. So yeah, you gotta listen to them. You have to. It's, it's almost cliche in Hollywood, the way writers bitch about notes. I embrace notes. Hmm. I want notes. I, uh, obviously my favorite note would be, this is amazing, don't change a word, that would be great. But you know, I made a list of the 100 greatest movies I've ever seen. And number eight on that list is a movie called Amadeus. We were just talking about it. Amadeus, which won Best Picture in 1984. Well, Peter Schaffer, who um, was already a giant writer by the time he wrote Amadeus, wrote 46 drafts, 46 drafts of that movie. That means 45 times he thought, this is as good as I can get it. Go shoot it. And 45 times someone said, Peter, we have notes. You can do better. And 46 times he said, OK. Now, if it took Peter Schaffer 46 drafts, I'm going to bitch that it takes me 10 or 15. Captain Phillips was a 15th draft. OK, I didn't get it there the first 14 times. OK, fine. I need help. I need help. Now, what I find in general, in general, not always, but in general, listen to their problems, ignore their solutions. Hmm. In general. Generally, they will give you notes if they give you something proscriptive, I'm sorry, prescriptive, that will, um, that is designed to say, hey, let's try it this way, they will generally give you stuff that sounds like other movies. So generally, their suggestions won't help. Generally, not always. Sometimes you work with great creative people, but their problems matter. If they were supposed to cry on page 60 and they didn't, that's not because there's something wrong with them. You didn't get it there. You didn't make them cry. That's on you. Now. As you get older, you begin to realize how to fix that. When you're young and people say, oh, that scene where I was supposed to cry on page 60, I didn't. A younger writer goes to page 60 and starts trying to make it more emotional. The fact is they didn't cry on page 60. The solution's on page five. You didn't hook them into the character enough then to make page 60 heartbreaking. You learn that shit as you go. But the point is, I wouldn't have known to fix page five unless I gave the script to somebody who said I didn't cry on page 60. So I need notes, I embrace notes, I want notes all the way through the process. Now, is there a point at which you say to them, that's not how I wanna go? Absolutely, sure. There's a point where you say, um, What's tricky about that is if I do this that you're suggesting on page 20, it'll have a knock-on effect on page 50 that I don't think you're seeing. So no, I don't want to do that. But let's see if we can solve that problem some other way, together, you and me. Let's figure it out together. Um, always open, always collegial. The only time you really need to say no is literally when you're on the set and the camera's about to roll, where you just don't have time. Now, this is wonderful. So much here that we can really learn from. And, and um, I like this idea that a note is a symptom, is a symptom of a problem that, you know, um, you don't have to solve right there. You don't have to, you know, accept any solution that is given to you, but you have to walk with it for a little while. And this is why I like what you said before. Sometimes you just start listening to the soundtrack of a movie and you start to get in that mood and it takes time. I would like to say also this, you know, making movies is not like, right, we're going to make a couple of million dollars tomorrow. It's, it's a hard job waking up at 8 a.m., working till 1 and then again from 2 to 6 p.m. And this is really... Uh, 2 to 6, 1 15 to 6. 1 to 15, yeah, sorry, one fifteen. <laughs> Today we go together, by the way. I have a couple of ideas I want to share with you. But, um, but the other thing that is very important, please, and this is very important because I really care for that personally, is when he's saying, I need help. I want to kill the Hollywood-centric idea of the director that just says right and wrong. I don't think that's the approach, and what we're learning here is what I, we would love to see also in your thesis film, right? Collaboration. 
So who has more questions? Uh, yeah, there is one up there. Sure, because I've had a million examples of all of it. Um, the first time I ever everybody everybody understood the question. Uh, we have to repeat finding, it also for the people that are on the yeah, Zoom. It's Sorry, about my finding bad. Finding that line between collaboration and saying no, I'm I've considered what you're saying and I want to do it the way that it's that I want to do it. Um, the first time I ever directed was 2002, a tiny little movie called Shattered Glass, and and on it. Um, there was a star named Hayden Christensen who had just been in Attack of the Clones. Young, young guy, but had just been in this $700 million movie. And it was my first time directing. And we saw the character very differently. Very differently. And so we talked and talked and talked. And I'm hugely respectful of that process. And I want to help my actors. And I'm not going to fight. I'm just not going to. So it was going to be calm, and it was going to be respectful, and it was going to be civil. But at a certain point, um, we would do eight takes his way, and one take my way, and move on. I knew I had the take, right? And then I go and I put the movie together, and um, we go back to Montreal three months later to do two days of reshoots. We'll get you. Uh, two days of reshoots, and I sit down with Hayden for dinner. And I said, have you seen the movie? He said, yes. I said, how do you feel about it? He said, I'm very disappointed in myself because the places where I fought you the hardest are my weakest moments in the movie. Pretty amazing. And I said to him, Hayden, it was my job to win those fights. If I didn't, that's on me. That's not on you. And the next day, when we started reshooting, and I gave him a note, and he said, you are telling me to do what is 180 degrees away from my instinct. And I said, I know. Trust me, I will not let you look bad. I'm right here. I'm going to catch you. I promise. And he went out, and he crushed and made the movie go from here to there. So it was a combination of listening, being open, being collegial, being firm where I really absolutely had to, and letting the work ultimately convince him. And it did. So that's one example. There are also examples where um, the studio digs in about one thing or another and you are just absolutely certain that you're right and equally certain that they're wrong. Okay, well then you've got to find a language to communicate with them that's not going to alienate them, mm -hmm. right? What's, what's wrong with our politics today? That we are talking at each other mm -hmm. and nobody's listening, right? Um, so there was one point I had made a movie at a studio. I had written and directed it. Um, the cut was in really good shape and then I get eight pages of single space notes about how to totally change the front end of the movie in a way that I thought would be really damaging, really damaging. So I asked for a meeting with um, head of the studio. And I knew that if I walked in there and said, look, I'm an artist and you're a suit and you're fucking up my art. Like, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. It would have been cool. Though. What, it would have been great. And I would have had a bar story to tell. But the movie would have been worse. Ultimately, what's our job? The movie is the baby. We take care of the baby. That's it. That's everything. Everything you do that is in service of the movie is justifiable. Everything you do that is not helping the movie, you're a criminal. So what is my goal in that moment? In, my, in that moment, my goal is to protect the movie 
from what I think are injurious notes. And by the way, I wasn't just making this up. I had just watched the movie with a, with a studio audience and had scores in front of me to indicate that my instincts about the movie were right. So I sat down with the head of the studio and I said, okay, how can I put this in such a way that it will put her at ease mm -hmm. so that I don't make it combat? I said, listen, I think I've made a horse and you want a cow. And I can't make it a cow. It doesn't have the bones of a cow. I can make it a horse that annoys you less. I can do that. I can execute this note, this note, and this note. No problem, great notes. I've tried this note, this note, and this note. They don't work, here's why. Because if I execute these notes, it will cost you money. This movie has no car chase, no explosions, no nudity, no gunplay. We're not that kind of movie. We're a review-driven movie. That's how you're gonna make your money back. If I cut this, this, and this, it will hurt the performance of our lead character, it will kill our reviews, and you will not make money. And I'm here to make you money. And she said, okay. End of fight. Who's gonna argue with that guy? <laughs> Nobody, right? Now, did I walk out of there feeling like I gave her a piece of my fucking mind? No, I didn't. I felt like I had um, appeased, charmed, coddled. I didn't in any way express how upset I was. I didn't walk out of there like I would, I would have gotten zero points from a therapist on how I handled it. I didn't get in touch with my feelings and express them and say, God, you're really upsetting me, but I protected the baby. And that's the game. And, and again, collaboration, collaboration is a process and, and there are strategies and it is um, our job as filmmakers, the people job. You have to know who you have in front and you have to know how to talk to them and you have to know how to stand your ground, but also how to really um, make sure that, that they feel part of it. And this is beautiful, and I'm so glad that we're learning it, because only like that we really are working together towards a successful uh, piece of a movie. But I want to hear, because we we're... Questions here, more please. questions here, turn on. Yeah. Uh, my question is Jacques Royal. Uh, my question is this. Uh, you made several references as far as that character wouldn't say that and mm -hmm. get into the context of what it is and that character development. At what point do you feel an, an immersion into a real life situation so you can get into that universe is, is warranted to, to move that? So the question is how long does it take to know what a character would actually think or feel? Well, there are two answers to that. One is um, I've written a lot of true stories, a lot. That movie I just referenced, uh, Shattered Glass, uh, uh, Breach, Captain Phillips, Richard Jewell, uh, the miniseries I made, which was about Comey and Trump, um, true stories. You get there faster in true stories because you say, oh, well, James Comey wouldn't say that. Donald Trump wouldn't say that, although it's hard to imagine something Donald <laughs> Trump wouldn't say, but that's <laughs> another film. That's a whole other lecture. Um, so it's easier in true stories. Also in true stories, you have their actual behavior, what they actually did in a given circumstance, which just defines who they are, right? When you're in an imaginary circumstance, um, it, takes a, it takes a minute. You just got to get in there and shuffle pages and, and see what they care about. You know, what you want to do is know 10 to 20 times more about them than is actually going to be in the movie, right? And you, you start to fill in... And it really does get to a point of, mm, they wouldn't say that. And it might be your favorite line in the script, but if they wouldn't say it, you have to give the line to somebody else. Um, you'll, it, there's, just, there's just an internal compass that develops when you're, when you're doing it in a full-time way. You're just, you're just living with them, and they tell you who they are. Does that sound vague, or does that make sense? Uh, we're getting there. <laughs> In developing this character, if mm -hmm. it relates to a real life character, mm -hmm. at what point would you say, let me hit the street and go put myself in this universe? Say, let Instantly. 
let me finish this character. Real quick. Okay, the, the first thing I do on any movie is the research. First thing I do. So there was a, uh, uh, if I'm gonna go write about what happened behind Donald Trump firing James Comey, I'm going to DC and I'm gonna meet everybody, except Cheeto Jesus. But I'm gonna meet everybody else. And I'm gonna find out what really happened and I'm gonna read everything um, so that I know how does that world actually work and how did these people actually behave. If I'm, uh, the, uh, if I'm going to write something about January 6th, which I have, get on the plane, go to DC, meet the guards, talk to the head of the Proud Boys, which I did for five hours, talk to the Secretary of Defense, talk to the people who were there, talk to the reporters who covered it, learn. I treat every script like it's journalism at the start. Like, get on the ground and figure it out. And even if it's a fictional story, you might be writing about a world you don't know anything about. Well, there's research to do about that too. It might be set in a time period you don't know anything about. You've got to read about it. There's, there, I mean, there's no substitute for that research. And once you do, the realities of that world start to dictate things to you and then to the characters. This is beautiful research. It's something that we didn't touch upon yet. And, you, 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 yeah, that's, that's all about it. And I really can't stress how much important is also giving yourself time to get ready to that final draft, really. And maybe it's a question of years. Maybe it's a question of really finding the right person that can tell you this story. And this drives me to a question that is very important. Can I just add on that yeah. um, for Captain Phillips? Okay. I had to go on one of those destroyers, mm -hmm. right? I had to go on one of those giant cargo ships. I had to walk those grounds. They wouldn't send me to Somalia, thank God, I didn't want to go. So I have to read as much as I can about, you know, Somali pirates, but learn, 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 learn. And one other thing about Captain Phillips, because it's crucial about pitching, you know, so much of this job is about pitching, mm -hmm. getting someone to say, yeah, you can write this. So Captain Phillips was still on the destroyer that had saved his life when Sony announced that they were going to buy his rights and they were going to make a movie about it. At that point in my career, as I said, I'd been working at this long enough that generally when people sent me material, I had it exclusively for a week, if not a weekend. Meaning there were no other writers being considered and if I came in with a pitch, they were going to hire me. Captain Phillips was not going to be like that. Captain Phillips was an open writing assignment. It was going to be a beauty pageant. Every writer in Hollywood who wanted to go after it could go after it. So you have a choice to make as a writer at that point. Like I've built up enough of a career that if I go after a job and I don't get it, that hurts the brand, right? That's not good. But I really wanted Captain Phillips. I really wanted it because there are no true stories that lay out like an action movie. They just, they just don't exist. You always have to invent something. That movie laid out just like an action movie. It's scenes and sequences or action movie scenes and sequences. It just had an inherent drama to it. Great character, interesting bad guy, interesting world. Yeah, okay, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm gonna go do that. I'm gonna compete. And if I don't get it, I don't get it, but I'm going down swinging. So the first thing I thought was, and this goes back to how do you start, I thought, okay, what happens in that story? Well, narratively, what happens is a white guy gets kidnapped by four black guys and three of them get their heads blown off. That's what happens. Okay, not only is that not a movie I want to write, that's not even a movie I want to see. That sounds fucking horrible. I don't want to write that movie. Okay. How can I take that movie and just turn it a little bit so that it becomes something that I would want to write? Just a little bit so that you're looking at it from a slightly different angle. Same narrative, but a slightly different angle. So when I went in and I pitched on Captain Phillips, it was the shortest pitch of my life by far. I've, I've done movie pitches that were an hour, which I would not suggest, but I've done it. This pitch was a minute. I walked in there to Sony and I said, this is a movie about leadership. This is about two captains who wake up on opposite sides of the globe and they get dressed and they go to work. And their work 
puts them on a collision course. And once they meet, we're going to find out that one of these captains, in order to save his crew, would sacrifice himself. And the other captain, in order to save himself, would sacrifice his crew. That's the movie. And I got hired. It's the same narrative, but all of a sudden it became about something. So you want to take your story and ask yourself, am I looking at it in the most interesting, most compelling, most dramatic way? If I had to tell this story in an elevator and condense it to a minute, could I do it? In a way that would make people say, oh, I don't want to get out of the elevator. I want to hear more. That for me is, is half the game. Beautiful. Shall so we, we have, have some questions, questions from, from our online, online guests? guests? Telling what we're talking here. And, and, and this is very interesting to me, though, because it's so difficult when we have real stories out there. And that's what I want to go into right now as we are talking about adapting also, right? Mm -hmm. Readapting uh, literature for, for the screen, which mm -hmm. is something I find it very compelling and difficult. And I want to come up with this anecdote before asking how you deal with that and what is your process. You know, I always have this story that Stanley Kubrick reads uh, Shining by Stephen King and he's blown away and he goes like, I want to make this film. This film is so, vis this, this, um, this, this novel is so visual it, and I, I want to make this movie. He makes his movie, we all know it, right, uh, Shining. And, and of course he invites Stephen Knight and, and at the end of the film they meet together and so Kubrick goes like, so you enjoyed it? And he goes like, this is, not my, my, this is not my book, this is not what I wrote. And he said, I made it better. So, you know, as you are now approaching uh, just with Captain Philip, which is, you know, giving that twist that can make the film interesting, but also very, very smartly marketable in an effective way because this is screenwriting also, right? the balance between creativity, marketability of a product. How do you handle a film like Hunger Games that sold millions of copies and yet has to be translated on a different medium, which is filmmaking now? Sure. Um, first of all, when I read Hunger Games, um, I thought it was the greatest idea for a movie I've ever heard in my life. I mean, just dark, but amazing. But I had no idea what it was. I walked into my house. My kids were 14 and 9. I walked into my house and I said, what's the Hunger Games? And they both went like, like oh my god, dad, it's like, you're just such an idiot. Like, how do you not know what Hunger Games is? They, it was a huge thing. I just didn't know. So I go in for the first meeting and the meeting is three people from the studio. They don't have a director yet. They have a draft. The original, the novelist, Suzanne Collins, has written a draft. So they have um, four producers and me. And I start talking to them about things in the book that I don't think work. Just storytelling problems that the book has. And they said, well, you can't change it. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you can't change it because everybody in the chat rooms and everybody on the boards online, like they'll just freak out if you change anything from the book. I said, I know, but it, uh, this, this beat doesn't work and this doesn't really make sense. And, I've discussed it with the novelist, Suzanne Collins, and she agrees it doesn't really make sense, so I, I need to change it. And they go, no, you can't change anything. I tell them the story of Jaws, which was a bigger hit than The Hunger Games, and I say to them, if they could change the character's entire backstory in Jaws, like he's not from Amity Island, he's a New York cop. This is his first summer there. If, if they could change that, we can change a few storytelling things that are clunky in the book. No. So I remember saying to the producer, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go write a draft. You're going to think I've changed too much. We're going to fight about it. And the friction of that is going to yield the best screenplay. And then you're going to get the director you want. And that's what happened. <laughs> exactly what happened. I wrote a draft. She freaked out. We fought about how much I had changed. I bent a little. She bent a little. We yielded the best draft. They got Gary Ross to direct it, and the rest is film history. That's how that process needed to work. I needed to say to them, no, I'm saving you from you. These are storytelling problems. They've got to be fixed. I don't care what's in the book. And that's where I drew my line, right? There's a thing that I'm working on right now. It's a movie at Amazon. It had nothing to do with me. 
I was brought in to write their reshoots. Literally, I came in, sat in a screening room, watched the movie, okay? I have nothing to do with it. Watch the movie and then they pay me to write their reshoots because they got to go reshoot for a couple days. And on the movie, I'm dealing with a director who literally is saying to me, I think the movie's perfect. It's perfect. I don't want to change it. And I'm saying to her, well, they hired me. They don't think it's perfect. They want to change it. Here are your options. Get in front of this or have them take it away from you. But I'm telling you what's right for your movie. I'm trying to save you from you. It happens all the time. I'll probably lose that one. I'll probably lose that argument. But I'm still in there trying to protect the baby. Right? That's still the bottom line to me. Even if it's her baby, I'm still trying to protect it. What, what is interesting here is that really, and I want to thank Fred for organizing this masterclass where we welcome always new uh, professional working in the industry and uh, we're already working on to our summer uh, masterclass is really that you get an opportunity that's unlike, right, to hear exactly uh, from uh, writer, director, Oscar nominated, what is the industry? It could be pitching, it could be uh, right, how to receive a note, it could be eventually, however I hope, for any one of you to determine how you want to walk into the industry. So I, I really hope you're taking good notes because eventually everything is useful as far as you apply to yourself and that's why we created, that's why San Francisco Film School exists, right? How do we drive and make our own movies? So we want to see these in your upcoming thesis films that are due so soon. But there are more questions also. I want to welcome questions from the Zoom people. I know there are so many. Thank you very much for being so patient. And it's lovely to be in, in 2024 in person in, in this virtual space. If there is any question, is there any question? Uh, yes. yes. Can, can I, I ask, ask a question? question? We can't sure. hear you properly. Maybe, maybe just uh, write your question and then we'll have Eric ask the question for you. Uh, but I, I there's one. Go. How do you handle? Is that an interview? We'll have that open in just a second. Let's go with one more question here, and we'll have Eric uh, asking for that question. Yeah, here. That's where we're trying to go. This is a fantastic question and it deals for all the people that are watching us in Zoom in, you know, the, the, the balance between uh, making something creative and personal and making something marketable, especially knowing that we need to have that big return, especially if Sony's behind that picture, Warner Brother rather than Legendary and et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, so Captain Phillips is not a great example of that because the whole point of Captain Phillips was I didn't have to change anything. I mean, I had to make event choices, mm -hmm. but I didn't have to pipe anything. It just, that's what made it so great. It just, it laid out like an action movie, but that never happens. That's why, um, that's why I wanted it so badly. Every other movie that I've worked on, um, with the exception of the miniseries that I made about Trump and Comey, if you're gonna tell a story about Trump, you know you're gonna get lit up by the right. The only defense was, I stuck to the facts. So I had to be very, very rigorous in the Trump Comey story, particularly since we were, we were airing that in September of 2020, two months before an election. Like I could not put something out there that was not true. And by the way, you don't have to do anything with Trump except tell the truth and you can dissuade people from voting for him. So I didn't need to cook anything there. But the more typical example is um, I made a movie in 2000, or I was part of a movie in 2006 and 7 um, called Breach. Breach was the story of a guy named Robert Hansen. He was an FBI agent um, for 27 years who was spying for the Russians the entire time. And the work that he had done 
wound up getting 50 people killed, and I'm sorry, 22 years, and it wound up costing the United States government $27 billion to undo the damage that he did. He had given away our continuity of government plan. He had told the Russians where everybody was going to go in terms of, in case of a nuclear attack. Like, shit like that, okay? Robert Hansen was ultimately caught because the FBI put a young, not even an agent, a guy who hadn't been made an agent yet, named Eric O'Neill, in a, a vault with him, essentially, a, in a skiff. Um, and Eric O'Neill started to gather information on Hansen and feeding it to his superiors that made it possible for them to arrest Hansen. Hansen was armed the entire time. This guy was absolutely in jeopardy the entire time. So I put this pitch together, and I go and I pitch it at uh, Columbia. And as I'm pitching it, I'm thinking, I'm at about 90% right now. Like, I'm not really crushing it. I'm, I'm good. I'm good, but I'm at 90. And I don't think they're going to buy it. And I go home that night, and I invented something. And what I invented was a scene, which is kind of the best scene in the movie, where Robert Hansen takes, uh, uh, well, Chris Cooper takes Ryan Phillippe out into this park on a snowy night and fires a gun in a circle, and Ryan Phillippe has to keep dodging the bullets, okay? So it was a more visual expression of the real danger that Eric O'Neill had been in. It was a scene that did not happen. But here's the key thing totally true to the spirit of events, right? Absolutely true to the spirit of events. Went in the next day to Universal, pitched the exact same story, including that scene, sold it, okay? So that to me is the line. So you feel like you justified it, not 100%. to the scene, but to the audience based on? 100%. Was this guy in jeopardy? Yes. Was the other guy armed? Yes. Did he want to kill him? Absolutely. Did he ever take him out in the park? No. Mm -hmm. Just didn't matter, mm -hmm. right? So that to me is, is where I am being totally true to the spirit of events, but I'm telling a better story, and that to me is fair game. Here's a question from an online guest. In filmmaking, which I'm, I'm very happy can you, can with Can you guys hear? Um, we having someone from the Zoom world? Yes, from All Zoom right, world. go for it. Okay, what books would you recommend a new screenwriter to read? What, come again, what, what? What books, what books, books yeah. would you recommend a new screenwriter should read? Okay, and what is your name? Uh, my name is Eric. Okay, okay Eric. thank you, Eric. Okay, first, most important, read Adventures in the Screen Trade by William Goldman. I think it was written in 1982. Um, absolutely brilliant, perfect book. If there's a Mount Rushmore for screenwriters, uh, Bill Goldman is on it. He wrote All the President's Men. He wrote The Princess Bride. He wrote Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. I mean, extraordinary career. Um, read that book for sure. For sure. Um, Adventures in the Screen Trade. Uh, William Goldman. Um, read the book Story by Robert McKee. Uh, I wouldn't be a writer without McKee. I took his class when I was 22, 23, weekend class completely changed how I looked at screenwriting. Um, I would start with those two. And then um, read the book Directing Actors by Judith Weston. Um, it will absolutely change the way you think about acting and performance. Great book. How amazing. There was a question uh, here. Who had a question? You had a question? Here's a, yeah. here's a question. One second, we go back to uh, so the... Uh, so my question is, like, as a screenwriter, do you ever suggest or not suggest that people read books that are not written with an actor in mind? Oh, yeah, you can write with an actor in mind, for sure. I, I, um, I, I do all the time, just because an actor pops in my head. Um, you know, when I was writing Captain Phillips, I was picturing Captain Phillips. <laughs> um, but once it became Tom Hanks then you're writing for Tom Hanks. But um, there are lots of times when you're writing the fantasy screenplay in your head, you're absolutely picturing a given actor or a given actress. Absolutely. 
I think it, I think it makes it easier to do what we were talking about, which is, oh, she'd never say that. Yeah. Or I could absolutely see her saying that. What, what is the balance? You are a writer, director. What is the balance there, especially when you approach um, a project? So there's a range of stories. Let's say it's from uh, zero to 100, all the stories that are possible to tell in the world, okay? The range of stories that I think I'm qualified to write, it's kind of in here. Like just things that I feel like I'm the right person to write because I know enough about that world or I can learn enough about that world. Like there's, there's no version of me being the best writer for a story that takes place in Tora Bora. There just isn't. I, there's just other people who should be writing that, not me. Um, I shouldn't be writing romantic comedies. I, I couldn't have written Barbie. At the point of a gun, I couldn't have written that movie. No way. And what they did was great. So there's that. You're just limited by your experience and your talent. And then there's the range of movies that I think I can direct, which is like that. Like that. Where, because I don't think I'm a gifted shot maker. And um, when I write something, if we're really trying to beat the page, I may not be the right director for it. Like, I write Captain Phillips, Paul Greengrass is a better idea. I write Richard Jewell, Clint Eastwood is a better idea. There's a script that I, I wrote recently that Robert Zemeckis wants to direct. He's a better idea. Happy to step aside. Let someone who's a better director than I am go direct, great. There's certain movies where if I can convince myself nobody could direct that better than I could, those are the ones I'll go do. And those are the ones that I feel like I've done. That yeah. goes back to the beginning, which is waking up with that move in your mind. So that's another great advice here that we want you to get, which is also knowing your craft, knowing and, and not that. letting not letting the director in you torpedo mm -hmm. the writer in you. No. Mm -hmm. The writer in you is best served by having the best director, and you may not be the best director. There's a lot of things I write that I shouldn't direct. How are you doing in time? Are you okay? I mean, I, I think you have a car coming for yeah. me in 10 minutes, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Oh, oh coming at 2. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> and my flight's at 4. I want to be at the airport at 2. Okay. Can we move it up to 1.30? We'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get it. I'm one of those guys. I like to be at the airport two hours early. Great. I'm super neurotic We'll fix that. that. And so can it be moved to 1.30? Great, thank you. We'll, we'll fix that and maybe just two more questions. I, I know sure. it was a very long day and, you know. It this was man has to crazy. ask his question or he's going to burst. Absolutely. <laughs> so, my name is Justin. This is uh, my first uh, semester as well. Uh, and my question is about the uh, creative, creative process as far as writing the scene. Right? I know there's a thousand ways to be in text. And, um, you mentioned earlier about how each scene should set up the next scene, right? So, when you're writing a story, um, how do you use the things? So what are the things that you consider when developing the characters, the art, and the dilemmas they experience? And how do you use those things in order to set up one or the, uh, one or the other as far as the scene goes? Because you mentioned the first thing. Sure. OK, so let, let's think of it this way. Um, let's say that we were going to do a scene about me coming to speak to you guys. OK, okay? that's the scene. We've all agreed. We want to do this scene. OK, what would make um, that scene potentially more interesting? Uh, I had a fight with my wife the morning of the lecture in which she said to me, that none of this happened, in which she said to me, you know, you'll do anything for strangers, but you're not there for me. Mm. And I'm sick of you going out there and spilling your guts to a bunch of people you've never met before, who you'll never, met again, you'll never meet again. And the truth is, what I really want to do is go for a ride to the beach. So I want you to cancel the class and go to the beach. And I say, well, I can't. And she says, well, then we're done. OK? That makes this scene more interesting, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So if I knew I were going to do this scene, I'd say, oh, what if I put a scene before where we have that fight? Okay. Okay. Now, a lot's going on for this character up here. 
a lot of conflict, a lot of dilemma, a lot of turmoil. It changes what I do when I said, hey, maybe we should take a pee break. I'm on the phone calling, honey, are you at the beach, honey, honey? And she's not answering me. Okay. Now, let's say I want to jazz the scene up more. Um, what if, uh, while I'm in the middle of the lecture, I'm in the part on dilemma, and my dear friend Pietro comes up to me and hands me a piece of paper, and it says, uh, we just got a call. There's a bomb under one of the chairs in row three, and if anybody leaves this room, the bomb will explode. I need you to keep teaching. Forever. Okay. And I put the piece of paper away. So now I got my wife leaving me, and there's a bomb underneath his seat, and I can't tell anybody. And if I start behaving strangely, you're going to know something's up. And if anybody even leaves to pee, we might all be dead. Okay. That would make this scene more interesting, right? And then what else can I do to layer it? Okay, well, what I might do is um, the scene before that, I write a scene where you go into Pietro's office and you say, this is not for me. <coughs> this is just not for me. I, I'm trying, but I, I'm not getting it. And it's a lot of money. And I think I'm quitting the program. And Pietro says, go to one more lecture. Just listen to Billy. If that doesn't inspire you, I'll get off your back, but go to one more lecture. And you go, I really, really need to go home. I, I have a job waiting for me at a gas station and I can go actually make some fucking money. And Pietro says, I'm begging you, don't give up on it. This is your dream. Go to the lecture and you go, okay, it better be good. And you're sitting on top of the bomb and you don't know it. Okay, so I would layer that scene in. And then I would have some scenes with Fred. We are making this movie, by the way. I would, <laughs> guys, I would get the some, right. Everybody gets the right. right. I, would have some scenes with, I would have some scenes with Fred where he's getting some emails that seem vaguely threatening and he doesn't know quite what to do about it. Like, clearly there's somebody out there who's feeling like they've been wronged or disadvantaged in some way, and he's just sitting on it. He doesn't know what to do, okay? But at the last minute, before the lecture starts, Fred turns his ankle, because he was walking too fast to get here. So he decides he's gonna rest his ankle in his office and watch on Zoom. And he's the one person who knows what's on the piece of paper that Pietro handed to me. So Fred is out there on a shitty ankle trying to figure out how to solve the problem inside this room and can't tell anyone inside this room except Pietro and me. Okay, so this all started with me just giving a film lecture. Perfect. But you build out all that stuff, all of a sudden, fuck, I'm watching that scene. What's gonna happen? How are they gonna get out of this? What is it gonna say about me? Right? That's sort of how you do it. So you're saying like progressive uh, complications kind of like set up to make some decisions. Because, if they, oh, Ap because action. you can sort of see in your head what scenes have to happen now. Progressive complication, there's a bomb. Exactly. That's a big one. And you never know when it comes film, when, when, it, when a film comes to your mind, guys. So take notes because, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's really in improvisation. I believe improvisation is, is a great resource for every, every single person. And yet you were invested in the story because it was relatable. And we'll never stop saying conflict, 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 relatable, relatable, relatable. I have to have a catharsis. I have to feel empathy for my character. I have to be engaged in that story like I am engaged in these master class with Billy Ray. Well, you know, we're not done, we're not done. <laughs> we're not, we're not done. Yeah, I would say we're, we're not done. I'll, I'll stick around. You. I'll stick around. But he, I want to throw two more things at you. <clears throat> in terms of like life philosophy to get through this. Mm -hmm. We talked about The Wizard of Oz. Picture uh, the hot air balloon at the end of The Wizard of Oz. Okay? In the balloon part, is your confidence. 
your belief in yourself. That's what keeps the thing in the air. If that ever becomes ego, if you become the person who says, no, nah, I don't need notes from anybody. I'm a fucking genius. I got this. That balloon is going off into the stratosphere. Never to be heard from again. You're gone. It's over. In the basket is your humility. Your understanding that you need help. This is a collaborative medium and you're going to need help. If that becomes self-doubt, the thing can't get off the ground. So what your career is, just like your life, is a balance between confidence and humility. You'll find they're not competing virtues at all. They actually feed each other. If you have the confidence to say to someone, I don't know how this works. Can you explain this to me? Do you think the camera should go here? Does this cut with this? If you have the confidence to do that, to actually be humble, the thing stays in the air. Not for one movie, not for two movies. For 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm now in my 36th year as a screenwriter. Okay? And the way you achieve that is, I think, yes, it's true. This is a really hard business. No question. It's hard. It knocks all of us down and kicks us in the head again and again and again. That said, what you need to keep remembering is there's nobody in the world that has your voice, your talent, your history, your family, your pain, your sense of humor, your smarts. Nobody in the world has that but you. What you do cannot be outsourced to Mexico or China or Vietnam or anywhere else. Nobody can write what you can write but you. There are screenplays that you can write that I can't write simply by virtue of not being you. And every time the business gives you a choice dilemma, every time the business gives you a choice between leaning into that unique part of yourself or just writing like other fucking people, lean into the unique part of yourself. Mm. Write the thing no one else can write or write it in the way no one else can write it so that what's on the page is a singular voice that no one's ever heard before. Which in other words is be yourself. Be yourself. No uh, eclipse, which is the most you know, complicated and yet fascinating mm -hmm. way to to live life, and that's why it's beautiful, make it That's work. right. Um, I wish you all nothing but the best of luck. Thank you for your attention today. It's been a pleasure.